um, talking more about the biennial um, with our audience and our Facebook audience and everyone out there online. Um, some quick introductions for those of you who don't know me. Uh, my name is Gretchen Boyum. I'm the director of programming here at the Salina Art Center and in the interim um, director of exhibitions. Um, <clears throat> and I've been lucky enough to work very closely with uh, Ksenia um, and the artists and everyone else involved with uh, putting this exhibition together. Um, some, a quick announcement, uh, we're really excited because we are looking at opening to the public now on June 3rd, uh, and we are extending the biennial exhibition um, through June 28th. So uh, hopefully within you know, the span of a couple of weeks here, uh, we'll be able to have people actually come in and um, look at the, the gallery um, and see the works in the space. I think there's something really special about the way that this exhibition is uh, laid out and the way that you can move through it. Um, and we're really excited today to have uh, our juror, Ksenia Gerstein, um, join us uh, and talk a little bit more about uh, the exhibition and everything else uh, about it. So Ksenia Gerstein is currently the um, Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Ulrich Museum at uh, Wichita State University here in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, prior to this position, she held curatorial positions at the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Uh, she holds a PhD in the history of art from the University of Michigan. Um, and she is a regular uh, contributor to hypo, hyperallergic and other uh, journals. But I, Ksenia, just to say, I really enjoy reading your uh, pieces on hyperallergic and it's really wonderful to see, um, I think, representation from the Mountain Plains region on there on a regular basis. But uh, with that, Ksenia, it's great to have you with us today. If you wanted to start out by talking a little bit more about um, how this exhibition came together. Sure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, is it showing up? I see you. That's what oh, all I see on my okay. screen. Okay, good. Okay. Um, it's great to be here. Slightly weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I think, I guess well, this is our new normal. We're all still <clears throat> getting used to it. Um, it was a really wonderful experience working on the biennial, and I'm happy to kind of to the extent I can shed light on the process of how it came about, um, which was quite organic. And I think the first and maybe obvious thing to say is that um, it was very driven by the submissions. It was, you know, mm -hmm. we had, I think, 230 artists, is that right? Right. Of which- yep, 233. Okay, and I think in the end there are around 70 artists in the show. 60, was it like 67? Okay. Yeah. Um, so it was, a, it was a big pool and that was both kind of the challenge and the pleasure of the process, which again, hopefully people who go to shows know this, you know, it's not like there's a voice that comes from the sky and says, this is what the biennial <laughs> will look like. Um, you know, it's highly subjective. It's highly driven by the submissions and obviously, you know, kind of what I bring to it. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but that said, one of the things I do bring to some, you know, to a project like this is a real desire to showcase breadth above all because I think you know I, I'm not here to say well I mean there is a process of exclusion that's part of the process of necessity but to the greatest extent possible my desire was to showcase breadth um, and in the, in the in the brochure hopefully that comes out and what i really hope is that it comes out in the hang um and in the selections that there's so much breadth in terms of medium um and we have a section that kind of looks specifically at you know called pushing materiality at just the incredible array of materials that you can um uh that you can make contemporary art out of 
um, the variety of subject matter, the variety of formats. We tried to include um, video and of course, pre-COVID, there would have been time-based work that was included in the show as well. There would have been residencies and installations and I think given the circumstances, you guys have done a really, really admirable job of um, coping with, with the unpredictable. And in a funny way, I think like the move online and the number of events that have happened online as a result of the pandemic, I don't know, somebody, somebody should think about the way that I think it kind of highlights, I think, how much contemporary art skews towards the personal and the artist's presence and performance. I don't know. It's an it's it's something I haven't thought through yet, but it's an interesting outcome of the pandemic, I think, and a, and a, and a good one that I think there's been so much exposure for individual artists that maybe wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, so. As I said, breadth was a really big, and breadth in terms of you know abstraction, figuration, photography, painting, drawing, everything. Um, but then within that, I also felt like it was my task to create some structure, enough structure that a person who walks in is not just completely lost in you know hundred, a hundred or so works. And so that's where the sections came in, and they're very loose and kind of suggestions at best. Um, and one thing that I would love to hear Gretchen talk about once once I stop talking <laughs> is, is because she's been having all these kind of extended deep conversations with artists, I'm really curious whether the divisions or whether, whether the kind of context that, we, that the show creates for their work makes sense to them or if other contexts, if other kind of conceptual um, streams and strains have come out of those conversations that would be a really interesting way to think about the show like what could have been otherwise um but so then looking at the work over time what i started to see were these were the groupings that we ultimately um ended up with which was um the, the very the very first section you see when you enter the building pushing materiality very large work for the most part made in really surprising materials like uh, computer keyboard keys and um, unusual ways of working with clay and um, paper and um, trying to think of um, and coal which I, I really I really love those that piece as well and then um, in the in the three galleries that follow again something that I saw arise in the work is that there's kind of a desire, a need to be contemporary, but also references. We're all so shaped by kind of the ways of thinking about art that have been in our culture for centuries, if not millennia, right? Um, and so there were landscapes and landscape felt like a particularly kind of important thing to highlight in the regional biennial. Um, because the landscape, I think, does define the mountain and plain. I mean, actually, you know, the region is called mountains and, pl <laughs> and plains. We are so defined by our um, landscape that that's what we're called. We're called the, by the large landscape features that are here. Um, so that felt like an important thing to kind of spotlight and focus and group together in, in conversation with each other. Uh, still lifes and kind of ways of thinking about um, humans reflecting on their own material culture on the effects of our of our of our lives uh, sometimes on the landscape sometimes on the built environment that kind of is seems really far removed from nature so that was a theme um, the other big one that emerged um, and where I felt like there was particularly, not exclusively, but there were really particularly strong works by a number of women artists were representations of self, representations of bodies. And again, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, this, uh, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, so that gave women the right to vote. 
So it's a particularly kind of, and well, and it also, it falls on a major election year, right? Where women as a voting block, whatever that is, are gonna be important. And so that was another theme that emerged. And then the last room in the, in the space of the main building had to do with abstraction. And that one was really interesting for me because abstraction is something that I myself have struggled as an art historian to wrap my head around. Not visually, I feel like visually everybody gets it, but it's hard to find language to talk about it. At least it has been for me. And so I loved being able to think about how to put works together and I think there's some really interesting works in there. Um, there are two different artists who work with um, one set of works uses parts of a camera as abstract compositions and one uses um, kind of images from an instruction manual for photographers that look totally abstract but are actually kind of informational graphics. And so I love playing around with that idea of abstraction as suddenly very relatable to things to infographics which have seen you know which have taken off i feel like in the last few years with the advent of digital data now that we have a way to suddenly to create visualizations for this vast trove of data that we have the machinery to process um, so that was really interesting for me to think about the legacy of abstraction how important it was in the 20th century particularly in in Western art and how today it's morphing into something else, but in some ways I think it's becoming more accessible and available to people as like, oh, I get what abstraction does. It's not, it, it's, it's a different kind of representation. Um, and then the last thing, the last kind of piece of the project um, that was originally supposed to be there was about time and space and that was supposed to take place in the warehouse and so, some of the pieces that would have been there ended up being inserted in the in the biennial in ways that I think still work. And Gretchen can maybe actually, I don't know if you want to talk about <laughs> if there are other ways, you know, that you guys are thinking of um, incorporating that work. But does that kind of, is that a good start? Yeah, I think that's a great start. I mean, okay. I, one of the things that I loved is how these themes kind of came out. Um, and I think they really do highlight uh, what the artists are working with. And, and honestly, to answer your question from before, um, when I talk to the artists about the context of, you know, where their work is placed, I think for the most part, they've been like, oh, well, yeah, that makes total sense. And okay. um, they, they, I think they appreciate kind of that thought as far <laughs> as, um, yeah, like there's this, there's these themes that connect everything and you can think about, um, a topic like I've been looking at the landscape pieces this week so thinking about landscape in several different ways um, and how each artist um, looks at, at all of the ideas um, present in, in landscapes. Um, <clears throat> I just want to do give a quick reminder to people that are watching us on Facebook that we are open to questions if you ever if you have questions um, please type them I think in the Facebook or underneath our Facebook live um, and we will um, ask those questions to Ksenia as, as we move along. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you a little bit about if you wanted to expand on the theme of photography mm. which isn't a gallery theme but it is present throughout mm -hmm. um, the exhibition in different ways and one of the things I love is watching how this theme kind of unravels and changes, you mm -hmm. know, going through the exhibition. I don't know if you had some more comments about that. Um, sure. Um, I mean, I, this is, photography is something that I think about, or photography is a medium that I maybe think about more than others. And that just has to do with, like that's where the fact that I'm the juror comes in. Um, I had the first, my first curatorial position was as a um, postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Photographs at the National Gallery of Art in DC. And so the first kind of three really formative years of my curatorial career were spent thinking really intensively about photography 
um, both in aesthetic terms, but also in very technical terms. And I, I think for photography, for photography especially, they're kind of inseparable. Um, and I think, but at the same time, photography has become so completely ubiquitous that you know there are cases where I feel like the fact that an image is a photograph is really important and then there are cases where it's just expedient because photography is the most available means of making images and I don't think that that particular choice it doesn't seem to me at least like it was the central choice for the artist but there were there is a section in particular in um in the our bodies ourselves room that deals with kind of traditions of portraiture and self-representation and um there's a whole wall there which we did when when mark mark durfee and i and others were working on hanging the show group together um that alludes to vernacular photography and to to the way that photographs are kind of the lingua franca, I think, of how we think about images and particularly in all of the, in, in, in that grouping, it seems to be all about family. And that photography is so, I don't know, I have three photographs sitting on, um, waiting to be hung on my, on my wall. It's like a constant reminder. And it's a picture of my grandmother, my mom and me. Um, and that photography is that 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 format of family photography is so ingrained in us that even if the people we see in the photographs are not people we know, I think there is like an immediate emotional response. We immediately get what that format means and what that format is about and what it's meant to evoke. Um, and the and they thought the images were really lovely because they play with it and in two different works by uh two different sets of works by two different artists the faces are erased which i thought was like that that was really striking to me that two different artists who don't know each, each other as far as i know would make that conceptual move because i think they're both connecting to to photography as being both so ubiquitous that when we see it we're like immediately know what we think we're supposed to think but also it's so anonymous because there are you know billions of photographs out there um in which we won't know most of the individuals um so that was striking to me and the other place where i think photography as a medium was really significant um is in some of the landscapes and i think there again we tried to kind of group works there is such a rich tradition in the american west of photography being kind of considered the medium of record with somebody like ansel adams right of representing the majesty or going back to the 19th century Colton watkins um that it felt very important to represent kind of that ongoing um dialogue in terms of photography capturing that landscape and increasingly now i think and there uh, there are a couple of really wonderful sets of photographs one of them um, by somebody who teaches at wsu so i know her well but they are taken i think in montana and in wyoming by kind of the industrial in one case an industrial landscape that is now if you drive in the american west as much of as much a part of it right as the majestic mountains and canyons and the other one the other set of photographs was made on a uh it's an unsanctioned but also kind of a freewheeling shooting range uh, out in wyoming and i think yeah so there are these really wonderful ways i think of thinking photog of, about photography specifically related to capturing vast spaces and how and how important that is for, for the Mountains Plains region. I really like the pieces too in the abstraction gallery that are based in photography because mm -hmm. I feel like going through this exhibition you see this history of yeah like very formal photography, um, landscape and portraiture but also that you know 
the everyday photography that we see to this kind of photography about photography. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is just really wonderful. Um, I know uh, you came up and helped um, us with the installation and you had some really, you know, specific ideas of how you wanted everything to come together, which I think turned out really wonderful. Um, and I'm excited for people to be able to come and see this layout. If you wanted to talk a little bit more about the hang and kind of your experience with that. Sure. Um, and the, I think the hang is, to me, always a very collaborative part of the process. And I, I want to give a real shout out to Mark Durfee, who is an artist in the show, as well as the designer and uh, preparator with whom the Salina Art Center works. So it was very much a joint effort. Um, uh, but I think that's where I am so not an interior designer. <laughs> I don't have that. <laughs> um, if you saw my house, you would immediately recognize that. But um, but I like the hang is where I guess when I think about the hang, if I had to put it in the words, the the goals of it, at least as I see it, right when you're hanging the show, it are twofold. So one is you want like you want the hang to both seduce and educate in the same time, at the same time. And they're not necessarily, you know, and, and it's kind of, and it's a balance. And sometimes you'll skew more towards one and sometimes you'll skew more towards the others. But those I would say are the kind of fundamental goals that underlie the decisions. Um, so you want the, per you know, your viewer to walk in and if at all possible to have this first kind of wow factor to just have your eyes feel like this is a feast i'm so excited to be beholding this um and then then to have the second reaction be curiosity about individual works and also you know if possible kind of and that's where i think that that's where the thematic groupings come in immediately have a sense of like being situated in some kind of story and i think that's what we were going for um and so um that was so when we chose the space the um uh, what's the name of the the education wing right um so when we chose the education wing which is the first space you enter um for for the works in the pushing materiality section they all, as I think I mentioned earlier, they tend to be, most of those pieces are very large, they're very bold, and they're in materials that are surprising, unexpected, and kind of striking. And so that, that was, and we were trying to be strategic, there are these, you know, large, beautiful glass windows that face the street. So that was the that was the seduction aspect. We wanted people to see the largest pieces through the windows so that even if you're driving by, you might theoretically be able to kind of see a, see a good enough glimpse of a large enough piece that you make a mental note of like, oh, I wanna come back and see that. And so that, that space is, and it's also a very large space. So some, one thing that curators and exhibition designers think about a lot is how does the is the relationship between the space and the work how does the work hold the space does the space dwarf the work or um does it feel cramped so and that's also where it becomes i think very subjective and very intuitive um but one does the best one can to <laughs> to kind of create a container that um that feels like it's the right the right container to hold that particular work of art. Does that answer your Yeah. Sir? Yeah. Okay. Um, and one of the things I think just building off of that idea of walking into that education space and seeing those pieces is I think that really establishes this exhibition also is a, a very contemporary exhibition. And I love that feeling 
um, when when you walk in and and you just know, yeah, like this is about contemporary mm -hmm. art. Um, I do have, we do have a question in chat. Yay. So um, we have, um, has this pandemic affected how you might jury select artworks in the future? Seeing how artworks are being viewed virtually at the cur current moment. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, Honestly, I hope to God I never have to jur anything again in a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add quickly that it looks like that question comes from one of our artists, um, Barbara. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I think, as I was saying, I mean, I think, you know, and I work, uh, I was the juror for the show. I also work at another museum in Wichita. And I do think that a lot of us in you know, in the cultural sphere more broadly, but specifically dealing with visual arts institutions that just take it so for granted as a basic premise that people are going to come to our physical space and that's where we're going to congregate. Um, we're having to rethink um, what do we do? What do we do now? So, yeah, I mean, I think certainly if I were, if had I, had I um, begun this project this process kind of before the pandemic hit and knowing i don't think hmm, i don't think everything goes out the window um and i think the work that is visually the strongest would have still been part of it and i don't know even necessarily that the narrative, that the thematic narrative would have been completely different. But I do think that what, you know, what I was saying earlier, what the pandemic makes me think about is that particularly in, in these digital formats, the story behind the creation, behind the process becomes more central. Um, we can sort of, if we're going digital, we, in a way, like in a way it's good for visual artists because in a typical gallery setting, I think, you know, the, like the expected time that a visitor will look at a work is 10 seconds, right? Like 20 seconds in a, in a best case scenario. And suddenly, um, you know, you have theoretically the ability to, maybe get in, engaged with fewer works, but in a much deeper way and in a way that allows for more dialogue. So um, as it is, we did think of, um, of ways to, to, to involve time-based work, but, in a, but I think in a traditional museum setting, um, kind of things that are time-based and movement-based are the most difficult, right? Because they're not static, because the person has to be physically there in the space when the artist is doing their thing. They're kind of the most challenging to accommodate logistically. So I think, and again, I was working with the submissions that we had, but I think if the show, in a show that happens in a situation like this, when digital becomes a bigger part of the, a much bigger part of the game, my feeling is that things that are sound based, that are time based, that are movement based would become more prominent and there would be an even bigger kind of push for those to be central because digital as a medium of transmission favors them so much. That's my two cents. Great, thank you. And thanks to Barbara. Yes, um, thank you. For submitting and thank you for question. your work on the show. <laughs> yeah. Um, which, um, talking about Barbara, who was our uh, Jurors Award um, third place winner, um, we also had um, Rizlaine Fromeau won second place, um, and Trisha Coates won first place. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about the award winners a little bit. Are there um, ideas or themes that you see kind of that run through all three of these pieces or that cause you to kind of pull them out? Um, I think they're not, 
ideas in terms of what the artwork is necessarily about to me the and again it's it's subjective but i do spend most of my time thinking about art so um to me when i was going through the process of selecting um the prizes what was what was significant is a kind of it's a it's a balance in each work that i felt it had between kind of between conceptual richness right where it's clear that the artist is deeply engaged with their concerns and i think in all three cases the concerns are different but that there is a kind of conceptual depth that as a viewer i feel like i can lose myself in this work and it makes me think about so many different things and i can see the connections it's making in the history of art um and to you know to my own experience so there's that and combined with um a formal um and material kind of richness and sophistication that again i think comes from lengthy practice and engagement with what one does so um you know one of the one of the trisha's piece is ceramic and um maybe that has the labor as the most visible part of it you can just see how much physical time and effort goes into the creation of that work but i feel like in the in the drawing and in the collage too you can see that um just yeah i feel like that you can you start seeing if you, if you kind of look at art for long enough and you make a habit of it you know you how they say that it takes ten thousand hours right to to become really good at something i feel like the works that i selected were ones where you could see that there's just that kind of really long-term investment with one's craft not like in the traditional not arts versus crafts but in whatever it is that one does one's chosen medium that there is that long engagement that shows like a real mastery and that was important to me all right thank thank you um i just want to remind people again you know, please submit your questions for ksenia either about uh the exhibition or if there's any particular artists that you like saw in our online content that you would like more information about i mean it's pretty open um i will keep asking you questions <laughs> until we have some <laughs> off of off of our uh, the internet but uh um so maybe we could talk a little bit about the definition of contemporary art within within this exhibition and i know that was part of your juror statement as well um and then when we talk about the biennial it is you know we frame it as contemporary art from the mountain plains region mm -hmm. um and i think that is such a hard thing to define because it really means a lot of different things yeah uh, but I wonder if you might be able to talk a little bit about um, kind of how you see it within this exhibition. Yeah. Um, again, I think if one has a democratic impulse, which I'd like to think I do, <laughs> um, it becomes really hard to come up with any kind of strict definition of contemporary art um especially if you start kind of focusing on what you exclude rather than what you include um but i think again it was kind of breadth with breadth being the guiding principle um it's hard to talk about um so, 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 so sort of some aspects of what contemporary means i think uh were easier to highlight so i do think you know it's just kind of if you look at the history of western art it's undeniable that something happened circa 1960 and 
has been happening through the present day where suddenly uh, the kinds of materials you can work with as opposed to, you know, oil on canvas and bronze and marble, like it went from a fairly restricted set of materials to suddenly being um, just blown wide open. And I think work that kind of pushes what we can do with, um, with, with materials, with finding material form for bringing forth visual ideas, that to me says contemporary, and it can be, you know, it can be, as I, as I said before, it can be something as unusual as coal, which is like very, um, what's the word, idiosyncratic to William T. Carson, but it can also be, and I think apropos what you were, you were saying earlier about photography, it can be people going back, right, to the very, with something like photography, to the very origins of the medium. So there's, there are multiple works in the shows. There's a cyanotype, there are works that are printed and are made in these kind of really old techniques, but with new imagery, which makes it strikingly contemporary, even as it's also historical. But so that I think is one, is one way of approaching thinking about contemporary. Another one has to do, and that's again where the themes come out, has to do with ideas and with, you know, kind of the, the content of the images. I do think that a person who lives today in 2020 has a set of concerns and interests that are of our moment that can't, you know, people have always cared about their environment, right? So there's a kind of, that's the tension between the historical connections, but also the contemporary intervention. So there's nothing new about creating a landscape, but a number of the landscapes deal with industrial sites as a kind of, uh, as a contemporary thing. And they're very elegiac images that I think consciously or unconsciously speak to a post-industrial moment where we have a you know, um, very particular relationship now to thinking about industry. Um, there are photographs that um, have uh, one set of works in particular, like kind of evokes plastic as it's, there are these really beautiful images uh, that they look like ocean waves, but they're made out of plastic. Um, so there are images that I thought that I, to me at least sort of subtly or very overtly um, evoked concerns about environmental degradation, which I think like that to me, I, again, I bring my perspective to it, but that, you know, if there is one key contemporary concern, it's that we as a species might destroy the only planet we have. That That seems urgent to me. And so work that I felt like intelligently and evocatively and formally innovatively um, spoke to some aspect of how complex our relationship with nature has gotten and how important it is to think about that relationship um, struck me as contemporary as opposed to maybe, you know, really, really um, technically sophisticated image of wildlife, but one that you know, kind of what we associate with quote unquote Western art, right? Where you depict the flora and fauna of the West, but that maybe conceptually is less rich in terms of thinking about, well, how do I as a, as a viewer, as a human living in this environment, um, relate to that environment? Um, so similarly, concerns about self-representation and kind of what aspects of oneself an artist chooses to represent um, it is, you know, it kind of, I think, is another fault line. So I talk about it in the brochure. I sort of don't make any mystery of the fact that I think feminist thinking in the broadest sense, not any one particular strain of feminism, but the insight that the personal is political, the insight that one's gender, as well as class, as well as ethnicity, that, you know, that one's uh, origins shape one's perspective on the world, I think still remains 
very contemporary and so artwork that in very conscious ways brings that out um, is to me a hallmark of contemporary art. So that's that's what we went for. I thought that was a really good answer. <laughs> For a really, yeah, question that has multiple answers. For, there's, <laughs> for a question that has no good answer. <laughs> um, I do have another question from one of our viewers. This one comes from Mark Durfee, who is another, who is the preparator and another one of the artists in the exhibition. Um, he, he was asking if we talked about um, what was going to happen at the warehouse. Um, unfortunately, with what is happening, we won't be able to have the residencies that we planned. Um, but I thought maybe you, we could talk a little bit more about those artists, because I think they fill a you know, very particular niche in this whole exhibition. Um, Rachel F. Buller, Monica Matto, and um, Alexandra Robinson were both, or all three of those we were looking at having them install their work uh, within the, warehouse space um and i think you know kind of building off some of this other conversation like installation art in particular is a very contemporary mm -hmm. you know medium of thing that what that artists do um mm -hmm. and i think and they all kind of like you had talked about deal with um intangible things like time and um and stuff like that i don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit more about the about that idea within, you know, what we had talked about for the warehouse. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the warehouse, um, again, kind of thinking about the suitability of a space um, to a particular work, the warehouse is this amazing cavernous open space where I feel like when you walk into it, you, you feel kind of lost and you are, you, you, you're, at least my natural inclination is to kind of start wondering about there's it's a space that allows for social distancing <laughs> even before the pandemic it's just so vast and so big and so the work that we were um thinking of putting there was work that kind of resonated with what this space would allow which is to to get lost as opposed to the main space where there is just less less room to uh, allow any one work to be kind of completely separate from everything else. So we were thinking of work that would encourage you to kind of immerse yourself in it, get lost, spend time. Um, and so then that, that was where some of the more kind of uh, the sound-based pieces were going to be so i believe both alexandra robinson's work um and rachel fuller's work had really significant sound components and would and the space would allow you to stay and really listen um which is also i don't know it's something i still find really fascinating about visual arts institutions and that was an, like going back to the question of what is contemporary. I think that distinction has been so blurred, and so so contemporary visual art is, you know, sometimes embraces the visual usually, but also does interesting things with it, and disrupts the idea that the visual is separate from the oral or the tactile. Um, smell is a. I feel, I feel like smell is an underexplored frontier. Uh, <laughs> so and so is taste but it's probably only a matter of time before truly all five senses will be fully incorporated into contemporary art um probably not under pandemic circumstances though um, <laughs> um but so yeah and um so for somebody like monica's work i feel uh, monica maddox's work um she works she was going to create a really large installation and that again the warehouse was an ideally um suited space for a small piece of what would have been the much larger installation is in the main um exhibition and i think that's where 
the digital becomes, you know, becomes a very different medium. Um, there, I know there is, right, you've done interviews with both Rachel and Monica, and I would very much encourage anybody who is watching this to watch those interviews as well. Um, but, you know, I think, yeah, in a different world, those residencies might have become performances that are digitally based, and that would kind of create an immersive experience while you were in your own um, space. But yeah, that was kind of the vision, the, the vision for the warehouse and the residencies. Yeah, talking about kind of these different, I mean, you were talking about all of the senses being like involved in contemporary art. And one of the things, <clears throat> um, talking with Rachel um, about her pieces that I just loved was this idea, like her pieces are so based in these ideas of caring mm -hmm. and um, caring for other people, caring for yourself, but like extending this care. Um, and I just, you know, when we talk about uses of medium and I, you know, I feel like that she uses that almost as a medium in her work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have any other comments about her pieces and, and how um, they can. Well, I think I, there, is, there is one piece that's in the, it's, it's in the main exhibition space. And I think even though it's, it's, a, it's a single drawing, it captures, I think, something about the spirit of her work. And it's exquisite. It's, it looks like a drawing of a hand sewing, right? But when you come up very close to it, you can see um, that the entire drawing is actually made up of text. And I feel like that mm -hmm. captures so beautifully kind of um, the underlying or one of the underlying ideas of her art, which is that, you know, the small, even the smallest gestures of care, as you were saying, uh, that we associate with women's work, I think that's an important idea for her, um, are actually so laden with meaning and are so la labor intensive, right? But it's that, that labor is kind of, and the meaning can seem invisible unless you really pay attention to it. So I'm really glad that you can see that the, the piece that's in the show, and I think it captures something about it. Um, but yeah, I think hopefully there will be at some point a chance to kind of also let Rachel work those ideas out. And she does, she, she, you know, she, she does create work that works them out in time as well as space as performances. Um, and I do think that that's a really important aspect of, of her work and of contemporary art and that for the time being has moved online that you have to invest time and attention and kind of really slow meditative time rather than kind of you know productive productive kind of by the clock time into into your relationship with the artist with the art and into thinking about how that and i think in her case in particular i think she wants people to think about how sort of that experience in the gallery might transfer to how they think about time um outside the gallery as well right and i i should say that we're not our plan with these artists is to still have them in residency uh -huh. um it just won't happen with um within the time frame of the biennial exhibition mm -hmm. um but hopefully we can experience these um really i mean i think incredible ideas that the artists have i mean even talking with monica about her ideas too are just really um fantastic and i you know so hopefully we'll be able to see those play out um in the future so we have one more question in our chat um from vincent wren um and i think he is asking about the direction what is the direction of the gallery in the future um, in response to the pandemic and how it might continue to affect us. Um, and I, I mean, I can talk a little bit about, um, you know, at the Salina Art Center, we are going to take precautions, you know, moving ahead um, as far as, you know, making sure that we're cleaning everything and, 
having people social distance and, and other, um, you know, all the other recommendations that they're making. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts, you know, as far as, far as mask, knowledge or mask just in, for the win. Right. <laughs> or just in general, like, um, is this going to be changing how organizations work? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's still very much an open question. I do really, really, really worry about the future of American art institutions um, and the losses of, you know, staff, um, resources, projects that are happening and the ability to recover. I mean, I think we're all still, or at least maybe I should speak for myself, you know, just based on following the news, my sense is that this is not forever. <laughs> and so we are all kind of still operating on the assumption that we have to get through this difficult time and then we can go back to doing some of the things that are fundamental to what we see as our mission, which is, you know, we see ourselves as public gathering spaces, um, as a marketplace of ideas that may be not the best uh, analogy, but, um, you know, as our culture doesn't have that many spaces that allow for, you know, free exchange of ideas and uh, discussions and conversations about contemporary topics. And I think the in-person aspect of it is really, really crucial. So I, I think that won't change long-term, that we just really eventually want to get back to that. Um, but I will say, so I, I work at another arts institution. I work at the Ulrich Museum of Art on the campus of Wichita State University. And I will say that for us, there have been some positives to come out of this experience as well, and that I think will impact what we do when hopefully there's a vaccine and there's successful treatment and people are less scared to come in contact with one another. So my museum will remain closed through January of next year. And um, we have in the meantime, shifted to a public arts project that has to do, so we're in a very different position than the Salina Arts Center. The Salina Arts Center is a non-collecting institution. Whereas we are, we have a collection of about 6,500 works. And that's a that's really core to our identity as an organization that we have over you know since 19, the 1970s built this collection and so we've shifted our attention to how do we make how do we bring you know some fraction of this collection to the public at a time when the public can't come to us and i think that's been and so because we have nothing else to focus on no other in-house exhibitions that's become the focus of what we do. And all of us feel like that's actually been a really positive outcome for museums, at least to try and think about how, if the public can't come to us, how do we go out? How do we become, because it has been a very long standing concern for museums, right? At a time when they are competing with so many other possible things that people could do with their attention and time, how do we, become attractive to our audiences? How do we build new audiences? So that for us has been the solution. And I think, you know, depending on our project will start happening July 1st and go through November or December. And depending on the feedback, I'm hoping that we'll find that there's actually a really positive response and that people like the fact that the museum is now in their public space. We're gonna be using advertising billboards to display works from our collection um so that's been one kind of possible outcome that i've experienced the other thing that i think you know and that's true you know i think you guys have done more digital content i imagine than you've ever done before right yeah i mean i agree with this kind of i think the positivity of 
you know, this kind of exploration of digital content yeah. with um, institutions all across the country. Exactly. Um, we've been able to take advantage of that. And yeah, like our audience has really been able to engage with a lot of the stuff that is happening at the Art Center, even though they can't come in. Mm -hmm. um, but even personally, I've really enjoyed um, the fact that museums all over are putting, yeah. you know, events like this, like Lunch and Learns or Artist Talks and mm -hmm. everything online. And I can exactly. um, attend these events that I probably wouldn't have been able to before um <clears throat> and i just wanted to just kind of follow up a little bit with your comments about like uh working with the collection is it the meet me in the vault is that what you guys are doing that's a so we're doing that as well so that <clears throat> of it, so so the timing we just got really lucky like in february our online collection portal went live and that had been five years in the making that had nothing to do that was not like a quick fix for for the pandemic that had just been something that the museum was trying to get up for a long time and got just in the nick of time but <laughs> but so yes yeah, so we've been tr we've been trying to get people to go to the digital collection portal and find works there so that's one piece of it but the billboard project is going to be called the um community billboard project it's a separate thing but also connected because then there is still a really big digital component to it. And so I think, yeah, the, the short answer is that the one big thing that I think all cultural institutions are going to get out of it is a sudden level of proficiency and comfort with creating really quality digital content that most of us did not have before. And right. I think the responses from audiences have been really positive. And I think even after the pandemic is over, I think there will be an expectation that like you guys clearly know how to do this <laughs> why don't you you know and yeah like there's now i agree with you like if you can host you know if you can host a talk digitally that's going to be with an artist that's going to be accessible to thousands of people who are not in new york or dc or la or salina you know um why not do it i think yeah that's going to be the one big positive takeaway okay um, I have two more questions that I think are related, and I think um, <clears throat> they're a great place to kind of wrap up uh, this discussion as well. Um, one of the things that I've been doing with all of the artists when I've been talking to them for our online interviews is asking them specifically what it means to be an artist that works within this Mountain Plains region. And now I have two questions uh, one from Carla Prickett, who is also an artist in the exhibition, and another one from Barber kind of, I think, addressing some of these ideas about um, regionalism or, you know, what it, what that means. Uh, so Carla Prickett asks, and I'll just read them both and I, and I think you can answer them together. Um, would you speak to your feelings on contemporary art across the country and how the midsection of the country holds its own in strength of work? Um, and Barber's question is, can we as Midwesterners steal the art word art world from New York the same way that New York stole it from Paris. I'm not thinking we can steal all of the attention of artworks from New York or Paris, etc. But in regarding to contributions from the Midwest not being readily overlooked or underrated. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm with you guys. It's all, it's got, all, all, all I want to say is I'm so with you. And a little bit of biography. I well, I, I was born and raised in Russia, but then we moved to um, Western Colorado. So we moved to Grand Junction when I was thirteen, and so I grew up in Colorado um, from thirteen, and I and I went through undergrad there. So I do like it. It was an unusual immigrant experience, but I have a like a really deep connection to to this region. This was the first place where I came in the U.S. And then I moved to Michigan for graduate school. So I have a strong connection to the Midwest. And then I ended up being in DC for one job and in LA for another. And then I came back to Kansas um, for this job. And to speak to Carla's question, like I don't, I don't think there is a difference in quality. I don't think there is a difference in levels of talent. I, you know, I think there is kind of, in very crude Marxist terms, you know, big cities with galleries with infrastructure to support artists. 
do draw away talented people, but I think, you know, oftentimes those talented people have reasons to be in mountains and plains and, you know, not on either one of the coasts. And the, it, this was a, one of the reasons that being the juror for the biennial was such a positive experience was that seeing kind of that very concrete proof that there's so much talent, there's so much creativity. And I think the concerns, you know, I don't, I think there is work that in kind of using contemporary idioms sometimes speaks to concerns like we talked about with landscape environmental issues that are specific to this region. But I think my sense also is that there isn't a regionalism in the way we talk about 30s regionalism, right? When this was still, you know, when the rural agrarian part of the country was so dramatically culturally different from, you know, urban coastal areas. I think where there is a much more homogenous sense of contemporary concerns, as I was mentioning earlier, I mean, in terms of environmental concerns, they are on a global scale. So it's kind of, they will affect our region, but they will affect every region. So there is an underlying unified sense of urgency there. Um, and for Barbara's question, I mean, let's get together and think about it. I don't think we can, <laughs> you know, <coughs> I, I will say that I don't have a dream of anybody stealing any, like, you know, the whole narrative of, you know, Paris was the center of art and then New York was the center of art, you know, as an art historian, I'm deeply, deeply committed to a multi-centric art history that says that was bullshit in the first place. Like, you know, art was happening outside of New York, even when Abex was happening. There's, you know, a story in which there's only one important place where art is happening is always going to be exclusionary and wrong and inaccurate. I do absolutely agree that and I think everybody I know in the arts here in Wichita agrees, or, you know, Salina, everybody I've talked to regionally agrees that, um, you know, it's not that the talent that the art isn't there, but the infrastructure of publications, of galleries, of critics, of the people who create the discourse around the art is so heavily skewed towards the coasts in the U.S., and so um, Gretchen mentioned early on that um, I write for, I don't write very much because I have a full-time job. So, um, but to the extent that I can, I do try to write about contemporary art. And when I can, I try to write it, um, write about it happening in the place where I am now. It's also a little tricky because I'm a curator and I can't write about my own curatorial work, right? So I do think there is a real need. There's a real need to promote critical voices. There's a real need to create um, infrastructure platforms for those voices to be heard. And again, I'm hoping that maybe the pandemic will somehow um, spur us into action around that. I mean, the digital is, it does give us all a platform that wasn't there back when print, you know, you had to be in a print publication in order to be heard and you had to get advertising in order to publish a print publication. So um, I, you know, I'm hopeful. I'm genuinely hopeful. And again, just hyperallergic, just because I happen to know that publication, you know, I, like I know they've been running a series of interviews with artists from the Southwest, which I thought was so refreshing, right? That for because they have a New York outpost and they have an LA outpost, but finally somebody who is making a concerted effort to talk to artists who are not in those two major metropolises. So I'm I think about it all the time, and I don't know if it can happen, but I, I feel like people are aware that this is a thing that we need to be doing as an arts community in the mountain plain region. And I think the more of us can put in concerted effort to write, publish, you know, do interviews, promote, do public art projects that make it obvious and visible in our communities, how <laughs> relevant, um, and vital we are, the better. That's what I guess I'll say.
Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I thought really great questions and I thought your answer was great. I, I've worked a lot in mostly rural communities and I think there is that discrepancy of, um, yeah, like artists or galleries. Um, and I think writing is a big one. And I definitely agree that um, when you have people writing and talking about art, um, it's going to support the art community um, and help uh, help spread it, you know, across the country. So, you know, yeah, really great um, ideas and thoughts there. But it is um, after one, and I thought this was a really great conversation. I don't know if you have any other um, anything that you felt that was missing, or any other comments that you wanted to add. Um, no, I mean, I, you know, I, that was a great conversation for me too. And I want to say thank you to everybody who is watching. I want to say an extra thank you to people who are watching and asking questions. Um, that's always really, really appreciated. And those were great questions. Yeah. And I want to say again, thank you to the Salina Art Center for inviting me. Thank you to everybody there who made the show possible. And thank you guys for now making it possible for at least some members of our community to go see the show in person. And I would encourage people who can who feel safe enough healthy enough um to do so i'm gonna try and come up and see the show one more time before it comes down myself so i'm just i'm excited this is happening well um thank you i, I mean we appreciate the work that you put into this as well and it is a really amazing exhibition um and just to um reiterate we will be open uh, june 3rd through june 28th um, so you can come and see the exhibition. Our hours are Wednesday through Sunday from 11 to 5, but if people want to come, you know, contact us and we will do our best to make sure that, you know, people can um, see this. And all of the content is on our Facebook page and on our website and our YouTube channel. So yeah, I encourage people to, to continue to check that out. But, uh, well, thank you for your time today, Ksenia. Um, again, it was great having you, great conversation, and hopefully we will talk again soon. All right. Thank All right. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.